I'd like to talk about the history of your tribe. You know, when I visited um, the property um, and you hosted us with your team, uh, it was really amazing to also learn about your personal journey as a tribal member and then a uh, tribal leader, which I think is just really such an, a fascinating illustration of uh, some of the key concepts uh, behind uh, tribal history, like recognition or sovereignty. And of course, we don't have uh, time to kind of talk and, um, and, and talk about the depth and wealth of the history of your tribe. Uh, in a short space um, of time that we have available today. But I wonder if you can pick some of those key notions and use the example of the history of your own tribe to explain them to our international audience. Okay, well, thank you, Ewa. Uh, that's a lot, but I'll do my best in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, a thumbnail sketch here. Um, first of all, uh, I, a lot of people, <laughs> I joked, people in, uh, across the globe always think of American Indians as the Plains Indians who were chasing buffalo on Appaloosa horses, painted horses and all that sort of thing. When in fact, there were more Indians west of the Rockies here in California than there was anywhere else at the time of European contact. Um, and of course, the brutality here uh, was horrible. First, we were colonized by the Spanish, the missions then the Mexican period, and then the early California period. The first piece of legislation that the state of California enacted when it became a state in 1850 was called the Act for the Government and Protection of Indians, which legalized Indian slavery. And that law was not repealed until 1868, three years after the end of the Civil War. So California Indians were being sold here and their children were being taken from parents while when African Americans could actually own land here in California. So um, it was a horrendous history. And in my tribe, uh, then what happened after that is in the early part of the 20th century, um, the United States government uh, 19, around 1910 created the California Indian Rancheria Act. And they, many people were moving into California from the East and there were these small groups of surviving Indians on pieces of property and the federal government said, what are we gonna do with these folks? So they created small rancherias or reservations for what they called the homeless Indians of California. In many instances, we were just identified by the area we were in, not by tribes or anything. So in the case of Grayton, for instance, they put aside 15.5 acres for the so-called homeless Indians of Tomales Bay, Bodega Bay, Sebastopol, and Santa Rosa and the vicinities thereof. And that's the area that turns out to be um, all, basically all of Marin County, just north of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, up into central or southern Sonoma County. Um, at the time, there were many different tribes here and we're all survivors, so we de facto this tribe got created with these rights on these 15.5 acres. And at the time of contact, uh, there were about 20,000 of us here. And today, the nearly 1,500 enrolled members are the descendants of only 14 survivors, all of whom were women, usually concubines or wives of the early colonizers. Um, somehow our languages, our cultures, those women did a remarkable job. Um, so we were put on these, this small rancheria. And um, then in 1958, the government created, the one and no longer wanted to be responsible for all these little tribes that they'd created. And they created uh, what they called the, now the California Indian Rancheria Termination Act, which gave Indians the right to own, it was an updated version of the Dawes Act where you gave the Indians take away their sovereignty and their rights and give them their land. And the federal agents came out in 1958 in the summer when most of us were harvesting fruit. And they, uh, there were a couple old men that were left on the reservation. And they asked the old men who understood, certainly didn't understand the law, would you like to own your land? Well, that sounded good to a couple old Indians and they signed away everything. The stipulation was that this had to be done, policy was, by consensus of the tribe. Obviously there wasn't consensus, but we came back, um, largely did not have the education that would equipped us to fight this in 1958. And our sovereignty, our status as American Indians was gone. We own no land, nothing. In 1992, 
we began the battle again to get our rights back. Uh, we reorganized, and uh, I was a young professor at UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles at the time, and the elders called me and they said, you're smart. When you alluded to my own history here, Errol, and uh, until 1974, about 25% of American Indian children were adopted out until we had the Indian Child Welfare Act. I was adopted and first by non-Indians and raised by non-Indians. So it's a kind of a bizarre Moses story of me finding my dad's people and coming back and all that, although I'd grown up and ended up growing up around a lot of Indian homes and uh, Mexican-American homes and so forth. Um, and I knew a lot of the people um, and a lot of my relatives, as it turned out, um, kind of a miraculous story. But in any event, I uh, led the people and it took us eight years. We finally got a bill through Congress. I saw that Bush was coming in, Clinton was going out. I panicked, but we were able to get a bill uh, that was attached as a writer about something about kitchen sinks and it sailed through. President Clinton signed it on December 27th, 2000, two weeks before he went out of office. And we, to this day, are the last tribe in the United States of America to be restored, have our rights restored by an act of Congress. Now, there's been a few tribes, a couple tribes that have been restored by a determination of the Department of Interior, which, of course, can get appealed. An act of Congress you can't appeal. You have to write an act to undo it, another, another act of Congress. So, but they didn't. So we were, we got our sovereignty back, yeah, well, but no no land, no anything. And here we are in our Aboriginal landscape in a very expensive area for, in terms of real estate. Um, and uh, what are we going to do? We tried different things to get money. And of course, finally, then the gaming uh, option came up. And we knew that given our proximity to the Bay Area, that it could be a very lucrative business. I had never been in a casino, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I have a PhD from Stanford in modern thought and literature. I basically was an egghead. But, uh, and I and I always, I, I had that elite, almost that, I'm embarrassed to say now, that elitist notion that somehow casinos were de classe and, you know, who, who goes to casinos, you know. Um, even while I'm sitting here, I'm spending my life fighting for social justice, you know, we all have to do a little self-inventory, and I certainly did. Uh, but we sat down with a with the tribal council, and I was, you know, the chairperson. And um, we thought, could we do something that could change our community that would benefit Indian and non-Indian alike? Could we build our building LEED certified? Could we offer great wages? And, of course, could we of course, have the money to the, and the opportunity to change the lives of our people. In California, many Indian children were dropping out by ninth grade. By the time they're 14 years old, they're out of school. Um, the history of colonization, uh, historical trauma, has, it continued to plague us in multiple ways and in our families. Um, so we thought, yes, we'll make a commitment. And of course, uh, when I was writing books and when I write publishing books and making movies, I was the area's native son. They loved me. But, you know, when it comes to a question of power territory, the Indian becomes a wagon burner again. And I came back leading a casino. And, oh, oh my God, the outrage here, the death threats, the only good Indian is a good uh, a dead. In, uh, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. The notes we got were it was a horrendous. And of course, I know it sounded antithetical, Ewa, uh, a, a casino as a platform for social justice and environmental stewardship. Nobody believed it. They said, oh, Saris is just doing this. He wants to make money and uh, all this sort of thing. Never mind my history as an academic. Um, but uh, we, we persevered. It was ugly and difficult. Um, we did uh, then finally, after a long period open our casino in uh, November of 2013, just a little over seven years ago. Um, we gave, had union wages, union benefits. We took very good care of our people um, and uh, we developed a very profitable business. I borrowed a lot of money, a billion dollars to build this beautiful place. 
and um, was a no pun intended, it was a gamble, um, but it paid off. And today, um, just in terms of our tribal citizens, where we had instances of uh, a large dropout rate, now every one of our young people graduates from high school. Just in seven and a half years, we have people going to young people going to UCLA, Stanford, Ber UC Berkeley, uh, countless programs. We have programs that we do get some federal money for education programs, housing programs, or other kinds of things that we what did. But all of our education programs, we open it up to all Indians in Marin and Sonoma County, not just ours, and supplement those federal monies with our revenue monies for all Indian people, up to the tune of 650 Indian children in after school programs and so on, summer programs where we work with theaters in San Francisco and the Bay Area Book Festival where they read their stories. It's been miraculous, transformative. Mm -hmm. On the business front, of course, I've talked to you about the wages and that sort of thing, the business model that has become a model. Uh, but just to give you some perspective, in a little over seven years, um, the precedent setting compact that I made with the governor, we have to do a, a revenue share with the governor called the compact, the Indian tribes. And I made a deal with then Governor Jerry Brown, whereby a lot of the money we would give the state could come back to the nearby city and the county mitigation funds that we'd have some control. It positions the tribe in a very powerful position over all that money, let me tell you. So in seven and a half years, the city of Roner Park and the county have received over $140 million from us, more than any businesses combined in the history of this place. We have given $36 million to charity. Uh, uh, the issues that, were that, in, from in, that include so, uh, social justice and environmental stewardship. $15 million to create an American Indian cohort in UCLA's law school, $5.8 million, $5.7 million to the Smithsonian to develop American Indian curriculum for the schools in America. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm really proud. It's been a, a long journey, a difficult journey, but I think in our small corner of the world, we're making a difference and becoming a model of what businesses could do. As I like to say, if some of the big businesses in this country and elsewhere use the model we had, there might be more peace in the world. Um, and I think, you know, it's just so beautiful how you uh, talk about uh, the history of uh, the tribe, the history of the casino, and just really so clear. Um, how a trial by gaming has those different goals that go beyond just delivering, you know, profit to a small group of shareholders or private um, investors, right? It is really about benefiting the community. And as you say, it's just not even the tribal community and the tribe itself, but actually the community around us um, as well. And that's really what we're also trying to illustrate with this tribal with, with this tribal uh, gaming content series is um, how important that community um, is um, in tribal gaming. And one of the pieces as well that we commissioned that will uh, be coming out, um, it is about stakeholder capitalism, which is kind of what you know what is being exercised right now by the tribe and has been exercised for years.